Good morning. morning. Welcome to Wagon Town Chapel. A lot of distractions today, I'm sure. People thinking a lot of things going on, but let's start with the most important thing. Let's give prayer to our Father. Heavenly Father, we do come to you uh, this morning with distractions all over in the world. Some are good, some not so good, but we can come to you anytime, no matter what's going on, and ask you for help and you are always there to give it. We thank you, Father, for that. Uh, We ask you to be with us this morning uh, when we hear the words of our pastor, that we would really absorb what he's talking about. So it always comes to give you praise and glory, uh, and we thank you for that. We ask it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Would you please stand and turn to hymn 309. We'll sing the first verse of I Will Sing of My Redeemer. Town Chapel here this morning. It's great to have you here with us once again. And those that are listening online, great to always have you joining us as well. You can follow along in the bulletin for the announcements of things happening coming up. This week is Brotherhood. Thursday is Brotherhood. So uh, so make sure you make note of that. Men, uh, I'll give you a call this week to remind you through the uh, through the all call. But uh, so that's Thursday night. Uh, and roast beef is on the menu, I believe. Roast beef is on the menu for Thursday night. Our speaker is uh, Rob Sunholm. Uh, he is a uh, he was a pastor in New York City for a long time, and he's he's he's, he's moved back to this area here, and is in ministry here as well. And so he'll be he'll be sharing on Thursday night uh, here at six thirty. So men and all of those that are here, even if you're visiting with us here today, we'd love to have you join us. 6.30, it's a dinner and a speaker, and uh, we'd love to have you be there for that. We'll fill you both ways, fill you with the word and fill you with food, too. Food's always a big part of Wagontown Chapel, so, um, so it's good to have that, too. Um, sharing and caring is coming up in, uh, not this week, but the following Tuesday. Uh, so the, the 21st, so you see something in there about that, and it's chicken noodle soup, sandwiches, and you are to bring a dessert if possible. And uh, so uh, Renata Blevins is going to share uh, a slideshow from her trip to Israel. So that is the sharing and caring in, in two Tuesdays away on February 21st. So those are the things happening coming up. Obviously, this Wednesday is both C clubs and youth group and Bible studies. Okay, so uh, Bible studies are 3.30 again, and then once again at 6.30 or 6 if you like to Grab some coffee and, and some refreshments. You can come at 6. Uh, but 6.30 is the evening one. 3.30 is the afternoon one. They're identical. So, you're, and so uh, you can come to either of those. But um, uh, we'd love to have you join us for that too. Uh, starting next Sunday, uh, they're going to, in junior church, junior church will remain the same in all of that. But just at the beginning, for those that uh, would like to participate, they're going to have um, a children's Choir start practicing because we're going to have them sing on Easter Sunday, and so and and so the kids are going to sing Easter Sunday, and so starting next Sunday, just in the first just the first uh, ten minutes of of junior church, um, they're going to be starting learning a song, 
and uh, not a whole lot, just a song, and then they'll be able to sing Easter. And uh, but Junior Church will will remain the same for that. But um, Gwen and Dave Alexander are going to be heading up the the song part of it, and then the Junior Church teachers will take it from there uh, for the regular Junior Church. So that begins next Sunday. Um, so make sure you make note of that as well too. Uh, today's a luncheon too. We'd love to have you join us for the luncheon after church here today. Even if you even if you are visiting with us here today, we we always have plenty of food, and so we'd love to have you join us for that fellowship as well. I believe that's all the announcements that we have for this morning. We're going to have you uh, once again turning your hymn books to page 410, 410, standing on the promises, 410. And we'll sing all the verses, and when we get to the end, we will do the key change on the last refrain. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the praises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing promises I now can see, perfect present cleansing in the blood for me, standing in the liberty when Christ makes free, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promises I cannot fall listening every moment to the Spirit's call resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Yeah. 
standing on the promises of God. Amen. It's always good to be standing on the promises of God. Not one fails. You can follow along in your bulletin for the care and prayer. Give you a few updates on a few people here. Dave Grow came through with surgery well uh, there on Wednesday. Had to wait. The person before him had some complications. So he had to sit there for six hours, but he did eventually get in there and got it, got it done, and they were able to actually do um, remove less than what they were thinking they were going to have to do. And uh, so that was great. So he's home now recovering and uh, so he'll be uh, recovering here for the next couple of weeks. And so continue to be praying for him. Judy Berkheimer came through her surgery as well, and she is doing well too. I don't know if she's home yet. I didn't hear if she was home unless somebody else heard she was home, but um, I talked to her yesterday, and she was still at the hospital, but um, she already talked about she doesn't have pain down her leg. So that's a good thing. That was the whole purpose for the surgery. So uh, she does have surgical pain, obviously, but... Um, so she is doing okay, so pray that she comes home here probably. I think she said was, she was going to come home yesterday or today, so uh, hopefully she'll be home sometime this weekend. And so, But those are the two updates. Both came through well and doing, doing well also. Jeannie Dunn, she remembers she had that spot of cancer removed, and so she is, uh, I believe, here in the next couple of weeks. They're going to, I think this week, she's going, um, and they're going to, uh, tag where they want to do radiation. This is all uh, preventative radiation. So, and they will do like five treatments of radiation. Um, again, just to kind of make sure it's at bay and, and stays away and doesn't come back and all of that. And then, um, and then she will go on some kind of pill form. She'll be on a pill form for like at least the next five years um for for that too but uh so she's doing okay but that's all coming up here between the end of this month and i think the beginning of march and so pray for her as she goes through that too uh, her daughter is in the hospital too heather uh her uh her daughter heather is in the hospital and she had some complications she had some i don't know i don't follow it i don't understand it all but she had some kind of device in her stomach that helped her stomach and that needed to be changed or something like that. So she's having some complications with that. And so she's in the hospital. She had surgery, I think, yesterday um, with, for that. And so pray for her as she recovers from that and uh, has her own issues there, too. So that would be Jeannie Dunn's daughter, Heather, as well, too. Each of the other ones that we have on here, continue to be praying and uh, thinking of each one that are um, going through various things. My brother-in-law came home yesterday, uh, so which is a catch-22. It's good to have him home, obviously, for the family, but it's also a whole new stress level for the family, too, because it's all on their hands now, and so um, so just pray for them as they transition uh, with that, and then still work on, obviously, getting uh, therapy that he needs and making sure he doesn't bump his head, because he still has that skull plate off right now, and that all will probably go back on until at least the earliest is end of next month sometime if not april and so but pray for that and pray for his continued strength and growth and process as well too and just pray for his own mentality that he would be able to to uh, again when you're in that position that he's in you have to push yourself to really um get stronger and to do the the the, the treatments that they're trying to do with you and so um you know I've never been in that position, but it's, it can be frustrating for the person going through it, obviously. And so pray that his mindset and his push, his drive, continues to be there, too, as well. And so those are the latest updates that I have, uh, in addition to all the ones that you have on the list, the ones you have on your own hearts and minds, our country, uh, our nation, obviously. And again, as we continue to pray for those in positions of authority, Within our within our uh, our own country, from from Washington down to uh, Wagon Town, and so may we be praying for each and every single one of those things too. So let's pause and let's go before the Lord, our Heavenly Father. We approach you, we approach your throne, and as we approach your throne, Father, we enter your presence. 
And Lord, help us to be reminded that we are only able to talk to you at this very moment, at this very time, with not having to make an appointment, with not having to, to call ahead. Lord, that, that we are able to enter into your presence only by what you have done on the cross. That you have been able to uh, restore once again that relationship between you and us through the cross, through through the, through the payment of sin uh, for and on behalf of all who believe. I pray today, Lord, that we would take advantage of the time that we get to pray to you, knowing that we don't ever get a busy signal, that you are always available, that we never have to, Lord, make an appointment, but that we could readily enter your presence uh, immediately, in any moment of our life. And so what a tremendous blessing it is to talk to the holy God. I pray today that as we do talk to you, as we bring our requests before you, that we may also find our hearts to be in the right place as we do come before you. That we would search our own hearts. And Lord, we ask, as David asked, Lord, see if there's any wicked way in us. And I pray that you would, Lord, uh, help us to to uh, give that over to you, that you would take it away, and so that way we can talk with, to you and before you with a clear heart, uh, rightly, uh, before your throne. I pray for the needs of each one here. Lord, you understand, you know every heartache, every problem you know here. Lord, each one that are here uh, bodily, and even those that aren't here, Lord, mentally. But, and so I pray that you would help them with those things to which are on their minds here this morning. I pray that we would be fixed and focused on your word, for it is your word that ultimately changes our hearts, that motivates us, that, that, that pushes us, that causes us to pursue you even more. I pray for the hurting and the sick. Today, we think of each of our shut-ins, Lord, those that are recovering from their surgeries, Dave Grow and Judy Burkheimer, we pray for both of them as they, uh, Lord, recover. We thank you for their surgeries as they went through, that they are um, doing well and that they were successful. And we pray for continued healing there. We continue to pray and think of those in our church, our family here that have lost loved ones. Lord, whether recently or even a number of years ago, but that loss so real in their own hearts and minds today, we continue to bring them before you, knowing that you, the God of all comfort, can meet them where they're at, that you would encourage them, build them up. And I pray that their mindset would be on you here today. We pray uh, for these things. We pray for our country, our, our nation, our president, vice president, all of those to whom you have placed in positions of authority. We ask that you would work in and through their lives. We pray for the greatest thing to happen, Lord, that there would be revival in Washington, that there would be revival in Wagontown Chapel. Lord, it's, it's needed everywhere we look. We pray for revival within our own homes. And Lord, to be honest, if Revival begins in our own home where it ought to be. It will be able to flow through to the outer parts of our culture, our society, and our nation. And so I pray for revival to be real, genuine in our own lives. Lord, it begins with each of us. I pray today for all of these things and so much more. We think of our missionaries and each one that are in mission fields today, those that are still waiting to be sent off, waiting for, for uh, various visas and, and all of that that goes through what they're planning and doing. We pray for your provision and their protection, Lord, in their life. And we turn each of our missionaries over to you here today. We thank you and praise you for what you are going to do in the remainder of the service. We thank you for what you have already done through the service already. We pray it all in the precious name of Jesus Christ. We ask it. Amen. For those going to junior church, you can meet me down front here. Or... I 
I think I shared this kind of thing a couple, maybe last year or a couple years ago, but I, I think it's a great reminder, and it's a great reminder for our, for our, uh, our time in the Word of God today, too. Um, but I want to challenge each of you uh, as, well, as well as the adults here. And it's, it's amazing the, how much we can learn through creation, how much we can learn through the creation of God. And I wanted to show you a picture here up on the screen as soon as I see that. What are those? Yes. Birds. That's right. They are geese to be specific. I always want to say Pacific, but it's, that's not the word. Okay, but they are geese and they are flying, obviously, here. And they are flying many times. Geese do this. A lot of times geese do this, is that they fly in what they call a V formation. You can see in the picture there that it's a, it's a sideways V. And they're flying in that position for a particular reason that God had instilled in them. Evolution didn't cause it. It was what God created them to do. And they're flying in that V formation. There is a lead bird all the way to your right, my left, there. And he or she is leading at the time the picture was taken. And what that bird's proper uh, thing is to do is it is to, is to cause less draft for the birds behind. So the birds behind can rest and they don't have to flap as hard. But that lead bird flaps extremely hard because he is in the forefront of the wind blowing at them. But as he gets tired, he will slowly go back, and then another bird will take his or her place. And so they, at one point, depending on how they're flying, that whole flock at some point will have all taken a lead position in order to release draft from the remainder of the birds that are behind. Now, that goes on. And you don't always see that because sometimes when we're seeing a flock fly over, it's just the lead bird at that time and they might not have swapped at that time. But I want you to know that that's what they do. And also what they do a lot of times when you are outside and you don't pay attention to too much, but as you're out there and as you, as you uh, have the flock of geese flying over, it's rarely rare that you don't hear them. They are one of the most vocal birds that there are. So when they're flying and you start hearing them, and you know what they're doing? They're talking to each other. And you know what they're doing that scientists have studied? Obviously, they don't know to the very detail. But I'm going to use it this way, that they are encouraging each other as they are flying. They might even be encouraging the lead bird at the time, talking to each other encouraging each other as they're going. And then when they're getting tired, they say, okay, Bob, it's your turn. And Bob goes back and the next one comes up, right? But there's this encouraging of each other that they are able to fly tremendously long distances. Now they do stop and they land in fields and eat and things like that and land on bodies of water, but they're able to fly long distances because of what God has instilled in them in order to take those turns and each one taking a position of leadership from time to time, but also encouraging each other as they're doing it. And when they're encouraging each other in that way, they are helping each other to go longer distance, to, to stay the course. And I want to encourage you and the adults here today, as we look at our text here a little bit later, is that John begins to talk about loving one another again in the letter. And I want to give us a different aspect of loving one another that's not often talked about. That I believe that loving one another leads to encouraging others in their obedience to follow the Lord. And when you are encouraging others to follow the Lord or encouraging them in what they are already doing, guess that will help them to do? To keep on going. To keep on going. And at different times, it takes different people to take that leadership spot. But they're always encouraging. And that's a great way that you can show the love of Christ to other people. 
Okay? So be an encourager. Be an encourager. There's times where we all need to be leaders, and there's times that we need to take the break and sit back and let the leader lead and us follow. But encourage them as they lead. You guys can go down to junior church. Danielle and Sharon are going to play special music. I think I have the words on the screen here as soon as I get to the right. There we go.
you very much. There we go. All right, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for opportunity. It's always exciting for me. Lord, I love preaching your word and enjoy it so much. I just pray that you would encourage us today. Lord, may we be encouraged to encourage one another. And uh, by, by that, because, because we love you ultimately and our love for you, your love for us as being born again, the Holy Spirit working in us will produce that love. One of the fruits of the Spirit is love. And that, uh, Lord, may love uh, come forth through us and by you and so that we would encourage others to follow after you, to continue to remain standing on your word. I pray these things as I need them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Continuing our study in 2 John, 2 John here today, we're going to look at verses 4 to 6. We did cover verse 4 briefly last week. Wanted just to kind of hit on it again here this morning. Just the first couple of verses here, verses 4 to 6 of, of 2 John. Now, last week we had looked at how John placed most important of emphasis in writing to this lady and her children. And again, we talked about what that can mean. It could be, it could be a lady, it could, it could be a born again lady who has children and a lot of children. And so John could be writing to them, but many believe it to be, um, again, in this time, persecution was going on, a lot of false teachers happening, which is the purpose of the letter, which we're going to get into more next week than, than we are this week. But um, is that uh, John writing this letter, so it would be kind of like maybe even a hidden letter to the church, to a local home church. Remember, a lot of churches meeting in the homes at this point, and it could have been a letter written to a home church, so if it got into the wrong hands, that it would just be looking like it was written to a lady and her children. But it could be written to, and most importantly, a home church written to uh, a lady who had opened up their home to have the church there, and her children being the members of that church. Okay, so a lot there, but uh, who it's written to and not as important as what is written. Okay, and we talked about last week is that ultimately the most important thing that we wanted to grasp through this is the truth of Jesus Christ. What is, what is truth? And that, the, and, that, and that truth does not change. Because when it's Jesus Christ, which he is the way, the truth, and the life, his word is also true because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, John 1.1 1, 1 and verse 14. And so we see that the truth is ultimately Jesus Christ, and because he does not change, neither does truth of Christ change. Regardless of culture, regardless of society, regardless of feelings, regardless of emotions, regardless of popularity or lack of, Jesus Christ is the truth. And so we looked at that last week and the importance of the truth within a local body of believers, but also within our homes. As parents, do our children and our grandchildren see the truth of Jesus Christ in our own life? Regardless of how they feel, do they see it in you? Looking at that and the importance of that and that we ought to stand firm on the truth of God's word because he is the rock he is the cornerstone for all other foundations as we sing are sinking ground so we looked at the challenge for us as a church as a local body and even the universal church for 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 you and I to stand firm on the truth of God's word and not sway in any way or compromise in any way, regardless of culture, pressure, popularity. And the same is true for parents and grandparents, for our own families to stand firm on the word of God, to not be swayed by the world, its peers, 
to be grounded, to be rooted in the truth. So that was last week. And so we pick up, let's, let's pick up verse 4, 5, and 6 here. It says this, I rejoice greatly that I have found thy children walking in truth as we have received the commandment from the Father. I will point out in these few verses here, last week the word truth was mentioned a lot. This week in verses 4, 5, and 6, we're going to see a few other verses mentioned, but one of them being walk. Your walk or walking mentioned in verse 4 once and verse 6 twice. So may always pay attention to where something is repeated over and over again. But he says, I rejoice greatly that I found of your children. And really, the original talks about some of your children, not all of them, but some of them walking in truth. As we have received of the commandment of the Father. So John was so excited, so having so much joy, knowing that a local body of believers, some of them were walking in truth. Aren't you the same as parents? Don't you have joy in your hearts when your kids are following after that which is right? Brings truth or brings, brings joy to your life. Brings joy to our Heavenly Father when His children seek after Him, follow after Him. And that's only by the way of the cross. He says, I rejoice greatly that I found of some of our children, some of your children, walking. That word walking there is an obedience. Again, walking is a continuation. It is, a, it is an ongoing thing. It's not a once and done thing. It is a continuation. That when you are walking, it is, it is a continual living. So that John says, I rejoice greatly because some of your children are continuing to walk after the truth. They're continuing in it. Not just once and done. And so he rejoiced in that. Now, we're going to talk more about that verse and what I think that there's much more in that verse. We're going to jump back to it, but let's look at verse 5 as we move on. And now I beseech you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we had had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So Paul, or excuse me, John encouraging, addressing this lady or this home church to walk after the commandments of God. Walking after the word of God. But I want to point out something here as we look at this, this loving one another. And we looked at this in greater detail in 1 John. Because that's one of the proofs of a believer, really. It's a test of the believer. There ought to be fruit, but there ought to be a love for others. Doesn't mean that your emotional love is always there, but because God loves you and I, that that same love is poured out in us through him by him, and so it should be pouring out of us to others as well, too. Loving people where they're at. Not loving what they always do, but loving them where they're at and pointing them ultimately to Jesus. But we see here, and this is what I want to point out, a different aspect. Now let me say this, that that yes, we have talked time and time again about this love for one another. And you're starting to thinking, Tim, how many times are we going to hear about this? Well, let me emphasize that because it's mentioned so much, maybe the church really needs to hear it more. A love for others. And we're going to talk about this love a little bit. This is not loving what other people do. It's not accepting what they do either. But it's loving them even through what they do, but loving them to point them to do that which is right in obedience to Christ. Because that's what Jesus did all the time, did he not? Yes, Jesus ate with sinners and he talked with sinners all the time. Oh, 
Well, everybody's a sinner, obviously, but there were those that were bigger sinners to those that were there. And Jesus spent time with them. But Jesus never okayed what they did. Remember the woman at the well. He pointed out that she had more than one husband. Remember the lady who they were going to stone and Jesus began to write in the ground on the dirt. And what did he say to those that were getting ready to stone them? If anybody here hasn't ever sinned, I'm going to paraphrase here. If you haven't sinned, then you can cast the first stone, right? Nobody cast a stone that day. But then he turned to the woman. He didn't say, you're okay. I'm going to let you go in your sin. He didn't overlook it. What did he say? Go and sin no more. So love is not coming alongside other people and not mentioning what they're doing is wrong. It is also coming alongside those people, encouraging them to see Jesus for who he really is. So I think a big part of loving one another is it encourages obedience. It encourages obedience. Let me, let me point out a wonderful example right here in verse 4. John does it because he's not just playing the role. He's doing it because I believe that he is genuine and he loves those to whom he's writing to. So he says this, I rejoice greatly that I found your children walking in truth as we have received the commandment of the Father. So he is encouraging them. I rejoice by what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing in some of you who are walking after truth. So he's encouraging them out of love but encouraging them towards obedience. Let me put it this way. You know, we have all heard probably in this lifetime by far that there are five love languages, right? The five love languages. And now there's five love languages. There is one to which John is stating here that I just want to use as an example here too. And the five love languages are quality time, gifts, physical touch, uh, words of affirmation and acts of service. John is state showing here words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. So out of love, he's affirming them. He's encouraging them. He's literally praising them for their obedience. I rejoice greatly because you are walking continually, living in the truth of Jesus Christ. Now let me put it in terms that you and I can understand today. Let's say somebody walks into your home and they're there and they look in your home and you're saying, man, your home is so beautiful. Man, look how beautiful and clean your house is. And that, that makes you feel good, doesn't it? That's a word of affirmation. What's that gonna do? For you, the next time that you know they're coming to your house, what are you going to do again? You're going to clean it just like you did the last time. And it might be two hours before they come. It might look like a tornado hit an hour before they come. But when they come, guess what it's going to cause you to do? Because you were praised in that. Another illustration. Some of people may have talked to you over the years and you say, they come up to you and say, man, you, that color looks great on you. I really like that color on you. It looks great. So what are you going to do about that? Eventually, it's going to be in the back of your mind, and you're going to start wearing that color a little bit more often, are you not? So when somebody encourages you out of love, now we're talking spiritually here now, not cleaning a home and, and not how we dress, but, but spiritually. John is, is actually doing what he's asking those to whom he's writing to do. Love one another because God gave us that, that, that commandment a long time ago. That's why he's saying it's not, it's not a new commandment. It's an old one. Is that you love God, number one, right? Number one. Two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
two greatest commandments. But a way of you and I expressing love, we don't always think about this. So when I was studying this week, I was like, God, I've never looked at it from this point of view. But love encourages obedience. So when John's stating, I rejoice greatly because your children are walking in truth, guess that's what's going to do for them. I want to continue to walk with truth because I like receiving the praise. So you and I as a church body, that if we are encouraging other people, pointing out how they've blessed you, pointing out how God has used them in your own life is vitally important and a way of showing love to other people. If somebody comes to you and say, I just want to thank you for always being here on Sunday morning. I want to thank you for showing up on, on the church works day. Or I want to just thank you because I got a card from you for my birthday and my anniversary, and I get it all the time. And it meant a lot to me to get that card. And I want to thank you. That's showing love, but that's also going to praise the other person, and they're also going to do what? They're going to remember your birthday and anniversary the next year too. But also saying, you know what, I want to just encourage you in your walk. Maybe there's something that you see in other people here at the church that, to which you can encourage them. And maybe it is just their, just their attendance. But you're, but you're pointing out things. And, and John is, is expressing it in this verse, really, that he's, he's encouraging a love for others by encouraging others to obedience. How often do we show love in that way? That we are coming alongside each other and encouraging each other in our walk with the Lord. And it might not be something that you've noticed. It might be something that you start noticing. Or maybe you don't notice it, but that you just start encouraging. Say, listen, hey, I, I want to encourage you. I'm praying for you, and I'm asking God to just do a work in your life and to, and to grow you closer to him. And that's a way of showing love, but also encouraging those to continue to follow in obedience to the Lord. And we need more of that today. Love is not always seen in, in, in gifts, or not only seen in gifts and, and just words and, and things along those lines. Love ought to be seen in, in how we encourage others. And more importantly, as we're looking at the text, is how are we encouraging others to stand on the word and to stand firm on it, to not be swayed. It's hard. You see it all through scripture. Joshua had to be challenged with it. When Moses had died and, and God had placed Joshua in position of leadership to lead Israel out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And what does God challenge Joshua there? He has, to, he has to remind him, I think it's mentioned three times, be strong and courageous. Three times it's repeated because Joshua was probably saying, who am I? But then also it's mentioned there in verse 8 of Joshua chapter 1 that you would meditate on the word day and night and that you would not turn from the left or to the right. And then you would have success. And then your way would be prosperous. And so it's obedience to the word of God. So ultimately, a love of God will produce Love for others because we are being obedient to him. See, it's, it's easy to talk about truth. Maybe not so much today, but, it, but it's much easier to talk about truth than it is to practice it. Much easier to talk than it is to practice. And as we talked about last week, when John emphasizes truth, now he's emphasizing love and and. In a, in a walk. So it's important to see that you and I can express a love for others by encouraging obedience and obedience to Jesus Christ. And that you and I would follow after him the same. We also look here in verses 5 and 6. It says, 
And now I beseech you, lady. That word beseech there means to request or I desire. So John just showed by example in his own life how he encourages them that they are walking in truth. And that by showing that is loving them, but also encouraging them to continue to walk in truth. But now he says, but now I encourage you or I request of you or I am desiring of you, lady. Not as I wrote you a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning that we love one another. So John saying, and now I am requesting and desiring of you to love other people too. Again, it's not a new commandment. It's one that God had given to Israel long ago. Again, godly love is not giving in to wrongdoings. Godly love is not compromising. Godly love is not, is not letting, letting others do what they want and you being okay with it. But godly love is encouraging others to do what God wants. To walk in truth and to not walk in acceptance. Are we encouraging other people to walk in truth? Or are we encouraging people to just walk into acceptance? Oh, just accept who they are. One of the biggest lies that there is is people will say, well, you got to accept who they are because God accepts them just as they are. Is that true? That God loved you and I. He's a holy, righteous God, and he died for sin. If he accepts sin, he would never die for it. But the holy God, the just God, can't accept sin. So he does not accept you and I in our sin. How, do, how does one come to him? Well, they are born again. And how is that done? By the washing of the word, by the washing of the sin away, which only comes by the cross. We talked about last night, I think, in a quick devotional last night on the phone. You know, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So when we stand on the truth and we love other people, we are continuing to stand. Not that we look down on them because you and I are sinners. I say it all the time. We're professional sinners. I need Jesus as much as anybody else does. But when we stand on the truth, when we stand and love people, we can meet them right where they're at because that's how God meets us. He does meet us right where we're at, but he changes us. He doesn't accept where you're at and let you live that way for the rest of your life. When you're born again, you don't continue to live in the sin. He'll meet you where you're at for the purpose of pulling you from it and to change you, to be obedient to him. When he talks about walking after his commandments, his walking obedience to his commandments, this is a love that John mentions here. This is love, that we walk after his commandments, that we live his commandments. Love is ultimately obedience to God's word. Encouraging others to do the same. Let me say that again. Love is obedience to God's word. It's encouraging others to do the same. A love for one another. Same reason to which Hebrews talks about God and, and, and what does God do to those he loves who are in sin? He chastens them, right? Hebrews says that God chastens those who he loves. So obedience is you and I encouraging others to follow and be obedient to God's word, knowing that you and I must be practicing it first. 
And that before the holy, righteous God, you and I are sinners also. John 14, verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If we really love God, we keep his commandments. Now, that doesn't mean that we keep them 24-7. We talked about this many times in 1 John. We can't because we're still sinners. We can't keep his commandments all the time or we'd be perfect. But if we love him, we will desire to walk, and this is what John's mentioning in verse 6, to walk after his commandments, that I will desire to, to live the best I can after his word. And when I fail, I have an advocate, John mentions in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The picture here in the text is that this lady is walking in truth. She has some of her kids or the church, this, this, this home church, walking in truth. And if it's not seen in the leader of the church or if it's not seen in the leader of the home, how can it be followed by the children of the home or how can it be followed by the, by the congregation? So John is leading them. I rejoice greatly to see that some of you are walking in truth. And I love you. And I want to encourage you to continue to do the same. To continue to do what you are doing. As I said in verse 6, John mentions walk twice. to means to continue to live in God's word, to obey. It covers every area of our life. Not just on Sunday mornings. Not just in our prayer times. Not just in our devotional times. But we should be desiring to walk after his commands in every area of our life. Much like Paul did to the church at Thessalonica, what he said to the church at Thessalonica, this is what John is doing here by his example in verse 4. But, but Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica and he says this in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 4. It says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So, so, so Paul's saying, you guys already know what you ought to be doing. The church ought to have a love for one another. So Paul says in verse 9, I know you're doing that. I don't even have to tell you. But then verse 10, he tells us why he really is telling them. And indeed, you do it towards all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, that same word John writes... Here in verse 5, but we desire for you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And this is what John is telling them here. And what I want to tell us today, too, as I close. It's not that you and I aren't loving people, although we aren't doing it always the greatest, because even, obviously, God knows that. It's mentioned over and over and over again. If it's mentioned to love one another so many times... We probably struggle at it. But I want to encourage Wagontown Chapel real quick as I close, is that you and I would continue to love one another. It's not that you and I don't know it, but that as Paul challenged them, I desire for you and I to increase more and more in loving other people. And there's a lot of ways to do that. But the way that we just mentioned today, just the one point, is encouraging others in their walk with the Lord. And we need people to do the same to us as well, too. Are you loving people where they're at, pointing them to Jesus, but are you also loving them in a way where you and I are encouraging each other, hey, you bring joy to my heart when I saw you doing this the other day at church. I just want to thank you for being a great example. And it's going to cause you and I to think about that and say, you know what? I'm going to continue to do that. 
I'm going to continue to pursue after Jesus. I'm going to continue to be obedient to his word. And when I fail, I have a church family who will come alongside of me, who will point me and help me to get back on track. Because the scripture tells us to restore those that have fallen. Not kick them when they're down. But to restore. And the greatest way to restore them is to always point them to the restorer. And that is Jesus Christ. So I encourage you today. Are you and I walking in truth? Are we walking in the love of one another by encouraging them to obedience of the word and encouraging them in obedience to Jesus Christ? That's the greatest way we can show love to one another. May you and I be like the geese, encouraging each other. And when one has to fall back, the other one takes the lead and does it. A church that can, that, can, that can work like that by only the Holy Spirit working in it will be a church that, no, that nothing in this world could ever hinder. Because we are following after the one who born us again through Christ alone. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in your word today. I thank you for being a God that meets us where we're at. A God that is patient with us, willing that none should perish, but that all come to repentance. God, I thank you that you meet me where I'm at every single day of my life because I'm a sinner. God, every day of my life, I break the very heart of you. And yet, Lord, you meet me where I'm at. Not to just say it's okay and you can continue on, but you meet me where I'm at so that you can bring me back to you. That I can see you as the holy God and, and seek forgiveness of my own sin. To be in right relationship with you. And I pray that you would help us all to do that as a church. Lord, that we would love each other that we would come alongside of each other. And Lord, I'm thankful so much for Wagontown Chapel because this is a, tre a tremendously blessed church to which you have, Lord, allowed us to be only by your working. <clears throat> there are many who are faithful encouragers, card writers, letter writers, phone calls. On the list goes <clears throat> of many in this room who are tremendous lovers of others, tremendous encouragers. And Lord, I'm not saying that we're not. I'm just asking that you would help us to be more and more lovers of you and lovers of each other and that we would encourage each other in obedience further to you. Thank you for Wagontown Chapel. Thank you for working in her. Thank you for working in us knowing that you are the chief shepherd and we are the sheep of the flock. Help us to pursue you, trust you, live for you, love you. I pray these things in my own life as well, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we sing just the first verse of hymn 431, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
Wow, to give us a great day, give us a good time of fellowship and food later here right now and bless the time together. Thank you for being a God that meets us where, is at, where we're at and yet changes us. Lord, we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.